Right. Dear brothers and sisters, we'll continue talking about the early days of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We mentioned that the first one who breastfed him was a lady by name of Thuwayba. She was a slave girl at the time of his uncle Abu Lahab. We talked about her in the previous khutbah. The second lady who uh, breastfed him was Halima al Saadiya. It was from a tribe, Bani Sa'd ibn Bakr. This is the name of that tribe. And they were Bedouins and nomads. And it was the habit of the Arabs to send their newborn children outside of the urban areas to, to, the, to, to the open spaces in the rural areas so as to uh, acquire physical strength and also uh, better emotional uh, development. When they are out in the open, they get to see the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they mature physically, mentally and emotionally better. Also, because normally in, uh, in cities, diseases were more common. And at that time, they had no good treatments for these diseases. And children <coughs> frequently died at a young age because of diseases. And that is another reason why they used to send them out in the open and fresh and clean air. Another reason was the fact that they wanted, all, uh, yani families wanted their children to learn the proper pure Arabic that is not tainted by any other dialects or words that come from outside of Arabia. And as you know, Mecca was a central trade city where people of all different backgrounds and different ethnic backgrounds and linguistic backgrounds may be coming to that city. And you find some words that come into the Arabic language that might not be of the pure Arabic and they get to be incorporated within the Arabic language. And there are many examples of this such as Sundus for instance and many other words. But once those words are incorporated in Arabic, they, they are considered as part of the Arabic. But still as a child, they wanted him to learn the pure Arabic and that is why they used to send their children out. Before we talk about Halima as Saadiya, who was the main breast a feeding woman for the Prophet Sallallahu I'd like to talk about Umm Ayman, who was basically the, his babysitter, Umm Ayman. Umm Ayman was a slave girl of his father, Abdullah. And, Prophet, and then she uh, uh, looked after the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam after the death of his father. She stayed with his mother, Amina. And she looked after him from his earliest days. And he continued to be in touch with her and he used to visit her regularly throughout his prophethood years until his last days he had this kind of close relationship with Umm Ayman and her name was Baraka. She was from Ethiopia, Habashiya, Baraka bint Tha'laba. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu he freed her at the, uh, at the time of his marriage from Khadija before he, before he actually uh, was, before he became a prophet at age uh, 25 when he married Khadija, he freed her, gave her her freedom. She married a man, his name is Ubaid ibn Yazid al-Habashi. He was also from Ethiopia and they had a child by name of Ayman. That's why she is called Umm Ayman. This child of hers, after the revelation to Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, he embraced Islam and he became one of the Sahaba and he also fought alongside the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu in the Battle of Hunayn and he was martyred in that battle. So her son is a martyr. Also, after the death of her first husband, Ubaid, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi suggested to his adopted son at the time, Zayd ibn Haritha, to marry Umm Ayman. And he also said whoever would want to marry a woman from Jannah should marry Umm Ayman. So Zayd, the Sahabi, the only Sahabi mentioned by name in the Quran, Zayd, فَلَمَّا قَضَى زَيْدٌ مِنْهَا وَطَرًا زَوَّجَنَاكَهَا According in Surah Al-Ahzab, Zayd and Umm Ayman had a child by name of Usama ibn Zayd, and he was the most beloved child to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They used to call him حِبُّ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ حِبِّهِ The most beloved child and the son of the most beloved man to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because Zayd, his father, was basically like an adopted son. He did adopt him. He freed him. He was originally Zayd, was a slave boy of Khadija, and she gave him to Prophet Muhammad and he freed him and he raised him as his own child. 
And then he actually announced that this is my child. And that was before he became a prophet. It was uh, Arabs had that kind of habit. Uh, there was no prohibition, of course, at the time to adopt a son and give him your name. And he used to be called Zayd ibn Muhammad. Zayd, the son of Muhammad. Until Allah uh, revealed that it is prohibited to actually change the name of the father of that son, of that adopted son. You can adopt a child and you can raise a child, but you keep his original father name. You cannot change it. So then that he went back to his original name, Zayd ibn Haritha. So she is the wife of the most beloved man to Prophet Muhammad who was his adopted son. She gave birth to the most beloved child to Prophet Muhammad Usama ibn Zayd. Her child Usama also when he became a man, he became a Sahabi and he was martyred in the battle of Mu'tah. She has two sons who are shuhada, martyrs, in battles alongside the Prophet Muhammad and as I mentioned, Prophet Muhammad described her as a woman from Jannah. So she could be considered amongst those Mubashareen Abil Jannah, those people living on earth who have been given glad tidings that they are of the inhabitants of Jannah. And she also helped his mother raise Prophet Muhammad. She accompanied her even when she traveled from Mecca, his mother Amina, traveled from Mecca to Medina to allow Prophet Muhammad to visit. At the time, he was only six years old to visit his uncles. He was, they were from a tribe called Bani Najjar. And the, uh, so Amina originally was from that tribe in Medina. So she wanted her son, Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, at that young age to get to know his uncles, um, his maternal uncles, Akhwal. So he, she visited, she stayed for a month on her way back in a place called Abwa. Amina got sick. And she died. And you have to know that both the mother and father of the Prophet Muhammad died in their 20s, so young. The life expectancy at the time was much shorter as well. But both of them, of course, they didn't die. At, most people didn't die at 20s, but they died very early. It just happened that they died very early. And we will talk about the wisdom Allah has <coughs> in store for the Prophet Muhammad to go through these hardships at a very young age so as to mature mentally and emotionally and to be strong and be able to endure difficulties that will face him later on. He did not have a regular easy upbringing. He went from house to house to house, from his uh, mother's house, then he went, go, goes to the house of his uh, uncle. His mother dies on the way back from a trip. He goes back from this place called Abwa back to Mecca. Uh, um Ayman is the one who looked after him in the way back. He stays with his, with his, with his grandfather, for two years only, Abdul Muttalib, and then his grandfather dies. And Umm Ayman is the one who narrates that she saw the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, sitting at the bed of Abdul Muttalib weeping after he died. And then he goes to the house of his uncle Abu Talib and he stays with him. That was two years later, he was eight years old. And then he stays a long time with Abdul Muttalib until he actually, يعني, after he uh, and he became a prophet after he married. He was still in touch with Abdul Muttalib, and Abdul Muttalib supported him so much. And he tried to call his uncle Ab, sorry Abu Talib, his uncle Abu Talib to Islam very hard. He tried so hard to soften his heart to embrace Islam, and he never did, even to the last moment. And we inshallah talk about Abu Talib in more detail uh, at a later khutbah. His uncle Abu Talib. But anyhow, he went, and Umm Ayman every time she would accompany him from house to house and look after him. Also, she was like a mother to him to the extent that he used to say that she is my second mother. He ummi ba'da ummi, my mother after my mother. And he used to call her ummah, which means my mother. And even when he grew up and, and he got married and he was a prophet, still he treated her like his mother. She used to sometimes tell him, bring me some water. And Prophet Muhammad would bring her. Even his wives would be surprised. Nobody talks to Prophet Muhammad and ask him to bring him some, to bring him or bring her something. But she is like his mother. So he used to treat her that way. And he used and, and one time Aisha looked, she was so surprised and shocked. How can she tell him, bring me some water? And then Umm Ayman replied to Aisha and said, I have looked after him much more than this. And he, he would say Sadaqat. She has, she has said the truth and he would serve her. Also, it is mentioned in an authentic hadith that one time he visited her while he was a prophet and some of the Sahaba went with him to her house and she offered food for him. The Sahabi said, 
I didn't, I didn't know if he was fasting or he just did not want to eat. So he didn't eat. So she really got upset and she started raising her voice. فَجَعَلَ tasqab. Tasqab means to raise her voice. وَتَذَمَّرُ عَلَيْهِ means reprimand him. This is what mothers do and it is okay. Yes, a regular Muslim can never do that. أَن تَحْبَطَ أَعْمَالُكُمْ وَأَنْتُمْ لَا تَشْعُرُونَ Allah said that to the Sahaba. You can't raise your voice on the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But this is the nature of the mother treating her son. Regardless of how old he is, he is still her son. Anyhow, so Umm Ayman also was visited after the death of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam by Abu Bakr and Umar. They said, we have to visit her just like the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to visit her during his life. And they visited her. And then when they started talking, of course, she got emotional and she started crying. And then they said to her, uh, why do you cry? Don't you know that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is in a better place? That Allah, what Allah has in store for him is better than what he had in this dunya? She said, I'm not crying because of this. I'm crying because revelation has ceased to come down from the heavens anymore. That is the reason she was crying. As for the time of her death, there's two different narrations. Some narrations say that she died about five months after the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And some narrations say that she actually lived a longer life until it was the ruling time of the Khalifa Uthman ibn Affan. Inshallah, time will not allow, but we will go back to the story of Halima. And I did read the narration in Arabic. I will summarize this in English, inshallah, in the next khutbah. I don't want people to be late for work. Uh,